Science Coordinator for the Key Biscayne Community Foundation. Uh, this is our second lecture for uh, the Citizen Science Program. We lecture once a month. Um, it's usually every third Thursday of the month. So even if you don't see the flyer or the advertisements, just know that generally speaking, every third Thursday of the month, we have a, a science lecture going on. Um, key challenge students, if you haven't signed in, there is a specific sign-in sheet for you. Make sure that you do sign in on the key challenge sign-in sheet. So I know that you are here and I can let your teachers know. The Citizen Science Program has events every Thursday um, here in the Lighthouse Room. We have lectures or, in this case, a movie screening. Um, we are a program that's meant to educate the public about um, climate change, um, the different ecological systems around Key Biscayne, South Florida, the animals and plants that live here, everything that, that you would want to know about the area. And then we try to motivate uh, students and, and uh, adults, even everybody, to, to be involved and to be citizen scientists and, and to get involved with their community and their environment and to do some good. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Mia from the Clio Institute and she will introduce our film. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Mia. I work at the Clio Institute, which if you don't know, uh, it's a nonprofit that educates people on uh, climate change and the climate crisis. So we work with students all around Miami. We work with the local government. We work with businesses and hospitals and we will speak to anybody that will have us. Um, and we break down the science uh, in a way that is digestible for you to understand. And most importantly, we give you solutions that you can take into your daily lives and into your communities. So that's us. This film was made um, last year and it's produced by National Geographic uh, and Bloomberg Productions. And it features our one and only founder, Caroline Lewis, who is here and will um, speak shortly about the film but before we start I just wanted to let you know the film is an hour and 20 minutes so it's quite long we're going to stop it after a certain uh, section and we're gonna have the opportunity for you to ask questions so while you're watching the film really think about it maybe if you need to write anything down what you want to ask Caroline so without further ado Caroline Lewis thank you Mia <laughs> wanted to tell you, especially the young ones in here, that all came to me for a picture. They have to have evidence that they were here, so their teachers give them credit. Well, now it's payback for those pictures. You've got to stage until the questions are asked. And you've got to ask questions that really provoke solutions. The crisis we're facing is real. The movie does a great job of trying to talk about some of it in a really good way, but it's so much more than that. And I want you to leave here, all of you, with a little fire in your belly. You know that expression? I'm from Trinidad, Caribbean Island, and we talk about people who effect change as those who have fire in their belly. So if you're understanding the climate science, then that fire should be lit, and we should do something about it. So I'm looking to all of you for solutions. Pay attention, ask good questions. We're going to cancel the Paris Climate Agreement. Global warming is not a problem. What is climate change? Is it truly man-made? The most insidious enemies of freedom is the environmental movement. The dirty energy industries have enormous access. There are real profound changes that occur on account of climate change. We have a problem, and that problem is getting worse. We have a national leadership void. With that void, it's absolutely critical that leaders stand up. The government doesn't want to participate. Businesses and individuals are just going to have to step in. Bloomberg Philanthropies is bringing leaders across the country together to march boldly into the future. Global leaders are the tip of the spear. What cities are doing is huge when it comes to climate change. We can make a whole country healthier. Million actions of a million people are what's going to move the needle on this. Positive change will lead to further positive change to transform the debate in this country. And recognize those leaders who are moving this agenda. I really am optimistic that we can make some progress. The federal government doesn't want to participate. That's their choice. But we're not going to stop 
we've got to do something for our children. Thank you to everybody that says we're all in. during the 20th century over almost the entire Earth's surface. Man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. Over pollution, unless checked, could so warm the Earth in 200 years as to create a greenhouse effect melting the Arctic ice cap. The temperature of the lower atmosphere will rise, perhaps to a greater extent, than at any time since the end of the last ice age. This evidence represents a very strong case, in my opinion, that the greenhouse effect has been detected and it is changing our climate now. The science is in. For decades, there's been scientific consensus that climate change is real, is caused by humans, and poses a threat to civilization. Solving these problems requires a transnational and a transgenerational perspective. Starting at the United Nations Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, the international community began working together to address the greatest issue in human history. 175 nations did sign a blueprint for the world's future. It's a weaker blueprint than many wanted, but the real test comes in the months and years ahead. Every year since 1995, the global community has gathered together to negotiate a lasting agreement to reduce carbon emissions. In Japan today, talks on a global climate treaty went way into overtime. The ink is barely dry on an historic agreement to fight global warming, and already its future is in doubt. Big polluters like India and China haven't signed on. Despite the failings of international climate negotiations and agreements, advocates from cities, towns, and states, along with businesses and universities, continued their pressure. Hundreds of thousands took to the streets of New York today. And renewable energy continued to grow. You may want to consider a job in the clean energy industry. It is growing and they need more workers. And in 2015, led by the world's largest carbon emitters, the world came together in Paris. It took two decades, but now a historic agreement on climate change signed by nearly every nation in the world. We have written a new chapter of hope in the lives of several million people on the planet. The new deal will not end global warming, but signatories have agreed to reduce their carbon emissions, and it's being seen as a turning point. The Paris Agreement represents the best chance we've had to save the one planet that we've got. In order to fulfill my solemn duty to protect America and its citizens, the United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. I was elected to represent the citizens of Pittsburgh, not Paris. It's afternoon, I'm sitting in this room, uh, I'm looking over my phone, and I get an alert. And the alert says, I was elected to represent the people of Pittsburgh, not Paris. Thank you. Read it twice, went into my chief of staff's office, and just yelled, Pittsburgh! And he's like, what are you talking about? And I said, and I started tweeting back, that Pittsburgh was going to stay in the Paris Agreement. In the aftermath of President Trump pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreement, Pittsburghers came out in thousands to say that we were going to take climate action into our own hands and move forward as a city. And so we decided to show how policy at a local level will help to change the world. Mayor Bill Peduto signed an executive order today that requires the city to follow the guidelines of the Paris Agreement. The solutions are at hand and it couldn't be soon enough. The front lines of climate change are now in everyone's backyard, from California to Iowa to Florida. 
Climate change is not coming. It's already here. I grew up in the heart of, of South Miami. And when I was 10 years old, I first started to get involved in surfing. I remember coming out on South Beach early on when I started to surf, and I remember just seeing vast land of, of sand before you hit the beach. And now, you know, I come back to Miami and I continue to be shocked at how close the water is encroaching on South Beach. I think we're going to have to adapt very, very quickly to the rising tides and to the rising seas. In Florida, there isn't much elevation. And so they are now dealing with perennial flooding in Miami Beach and Fort Lauderdale from what they call king tides. King tides are here and the rising floodwaters are creating some trouble for drivers and residents. Salt water seeping up through storm drains and over the seawall, soaking streets of Miami Beach. These are seasonal high tides that have been there for the eons. And yet now when they arrive in the fall, they flood the streets of Miami Beach. And that's because of sea level rise. In fact, there was an image of an octopus that was found in a parking garage half a mile in from the beach, and it's just showing that you know this is real deal. The big focus in Miami Beach, I believe, is on adaptation. They're spending five hundred million dollars on pumps to keep the tile of water off the streets during king tides. So you adapt to climate change by elevating roads, putting that green infrastructure in, slowing the worst effects from happening. So that's getting a lot of attention because people see that as keep the water away from me kind of thing. What they're not doing quick enough is addressing things like salt water intrusion. And when people talk about sea level rise being the thing that gets us out of here because we're flooding, I wonder if it couldn't be freshwater vulnerability that gets us out of here faster. It's estimated that in about 25 years, more than 300,000 homes and businesses valued at $135 billion may be chronically flooded. And by the end of the century, that number grows to two and a half million. These storms are now about 20% more destructive because of the overall warming of the ocean, which thus far is less than a degree Celsius. Imagine what two degrees Celsius gives us. So why don't we pause the movie for a minute and have come questions and comments so that those of you, it's a school night, so I know you don't want to be out too late. Those of you that have to leave, leave when the rest of us could stay and watch the end of the movie. That makes sense? So you've taken in some information, some of it you already know. You've seen how they describe the problem and how they showcase Orlando as solutions. So what are your thoughts? What are your questions? Yes, sir. Loudly. Why did we withdraw? Um, it's hard. There's a group called WASI, W-A-S-I. We are still in. So I think the president withdrew, but the rest of us didn't. And I think the reason, if I had to guess why President Trump withdrew, it's because the oil and coal and gas people don't really want us to stop using oil, coal, and gas. For them, it's income, it's money. So they would like to prolong it for as long as possible. And we're telling them, enough. It's dangerous and getting worse. So I think President Trump felt that he had to keep them happy. And so he's pretending to doubt the science. And I would love anybody who's friends with Mr. Trump to tell him that if he's willing to get on a plane, Air Force One, and go where he needs to go, then he trusts science to get on a plane and take off every time and on a helicopter. And if you trust science enough to do that, then you've got to trust the climate science, which is not just waving a flag, but everybody's waving red flags now. Yes, sir. Um, what do you think the next step should be to fix this climate problem we have? I love that. Did you hear the question, everybody? Yeah. I think you should run for office, young man. <laughs> I think all of you in here 
who have any potential to run for office. The fact that you're taking a Thursday night to come for a citizen science engagement discussion, thank you, Kibis Gain, for doing this, means you care. And people like you have either got to run for office or convince the people that you vote for how important this is. And it's, the climate change is a very political issue. It's not a partisan issue. And we've got to stop that nonsense and try and say, heed the science, pay attention. So what we have to do, first and foremost, is heed the science. There is no debate among the climate scientists. If you looked at all the climate scientists in the world, 99.9% .9 of them agree climate change is real, it is human caused because we're burning too much oil, coal, and gas, and living la vida loca with food waste. It is serious. There is consensus, and what we do matters. Now, if you wanted to bring scientists in the room, doctors and podiatrists and so on, you're not gonna get 99%. And that's what they do. So if you're quoting climate scientists, the science is real, it's severe, and it's definitely something we cannot ignore any longer. So I would say get your school to teach more of this, make you understand the urgency of the science, and then spend some money to invigorate innovation. We're America. We solve problems. Unleash the ingenuity to fix this. You know what I'm trying to say? Let's have some fun. I want to make Miami the place where everybody wants to come and think about what best to do and solve the problem. And then we come up with the best answers and the best models and we share it with the rest of the world. Because it's not just Miami that's on the coast. The whole world just about lives on the coast. So we're all vulnerable. But we are ground zero because we're so flat. And we have so much development there. So young man, heed the science, run for office, and innovate, solve the problem at a big scale. Yes? Yes, what are some of the small things that you do at home? It's a great question. We tell every human being, because we work with elected officials, chambers of commerce, frontline communities, and we tell them you have three superpowers. Each of you. You have the power of your voice. Have the conversation with your family members. Do not be afraid to talk about it. I come from very strong Republican stock in my family. And they don't mess with climate because of me. They love me and they know that I'm a lunatic when it comes to this. So use your power of your voice to influence as much change as you can. Use the power of your vote as soon as you're able to vote, vote. And every single election, vote. And if you're voting for somebody who doesn't believe the climate science, then go meet with them. Say, look, I want to vote for you, but you've got to get your head out of the sand and start working with me on this. Convince them that they can do something about it. So the power of your voice, the power of your vote, and then the power of your purse. Every time you spend a dollar, you choose the kind of world you want to live in. So it's good to research who you're buying from and make sure you're supporting the companies that are doing the right thing. That's not as easy as you think. But keep your ear to the ground and pay attention. In the supermarket, whether you buy this much of it or this much of it, a container, or no, all those little things add up. So as an individual, after your superpowers, I would say, look at your home. Look at your resources. What can you do? I would like an electric car. I have told my husband this. He's not listening to me. <laughs> but it's on my list. So as soon as I am able to get an electric car, we will. I would like every homeowner to put solar on their rooftops if they can afford it. And if they can't afford it, join a cohort to keep the prices down. When you put solar on your roof and you buy a battery to store the extra solar energy, you are powered for life. And that's how we do it. The battery storage was what was missing. Because you know people say to you, what are we going to do when the sun sets? 
We're not going to have any energy. And when the wind stops blowing, stop. There are things called batteries that now store all this extra energy so that when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing, you can still use it. So you can do that. You can change every light bulb from incandescent to LED lights. They, they give off so much less heat and last so much longer that it helps the problem. So your carbon footprint, you hear that term? Lower your carbon footprint. Your carbon footprint means huh? plant-based eating. Plant eating. A lot of the problem with climate change comes from oil, coal, and gas, but also animal agriculture. The fact that we love meat means that we have all these burping cows. People keep telling us the cows are farting, but they're really burping. So the burping cows emit a ton of, of methane, and that's a very powerful greenhouse gas. So if you could eat less meat, make that a goal. If you can decrease food waste, because all that food we throw away and goes into a landfill, breaks down and releases more greenhouse gases. So we keep putting that energy, oh sorry, those gases in the atmosphere that prevent that outgoing heat from getting out, enough of it. I want you to picture this. If every drop of sunshine, every drop of energy that ever hit the Earth stayed on Earth, what would happen? We would burn up. So what we have to think about is there's an energy budget the energy comes in, energy goes out. If we had no atmosphere, none, all the energy that comes in would be absorbed and converted, and energy would go back out, same amount. We would be a frozen planet. You get that? So having an atmosphere is a good thing. And having an atmosphere with some of those greenhouse gases, so that that outgoing heat energy, some of it gets re-radiated back, is a good thing. The problem is too much of those greenhouse gases there now, preventing too much of that energy from getting out. So we're actually in a situation where we're holding too much in. OK, let me do you and then you. Um, I don't have a question so much, as I just wanted to add to that. Um, one thing that a lot of people don't realize when we talk about methane is that, yes, it is a greenhouse gas, because everybody talks about CO2, carbon dioxide, as like the main terrible greenhouse gas. Methane. There's a lot less of it in the atmosphere, but it is 30 times more, or 30 times better at withholding heat. More than powerful as it, yeah. Is. And so that's why methane is so terrible, even if it's only a very small amount in the atmosphere. It works 30 times better than carbon dioxide. Good point. Thank you for that. OK, Winston, and then we'll come to you. Winston. Um, what's Cleo's next big, what's Cleo's next big step or goal, and what can we do to try to help? Oh, Winston, I want to marry you. <laughs> He's off the market for five more years. <laughs> um, well, we want to conquer the world. We want to fix this. And so our next big thing is a climate and health symposium. People aren't connecting the dots. People say to us, I can't worry about climate change. I'm worried about the economy. I'm worried about health. And then you care about climate change. So on. March 28th, we have a one-day symposium on climate and health with a blockbuster lineup of speakers and panels. I'll be moderating one of them. And I would really encourage you to come. It's on a Saturday, so students can come too. And it's a great learning experience. Clio is also opening offices, Clio offices in Orlando and in Tallahassee, so that we can spread the word about being a climate voter this year during elections. There's interest in Clio Chicago, in Clio Denver, in Clio LA. So what we want to do is to teach people how to be a broker locally in your community. That's what Clio does. We work with the scientists. I'm a teacher. I'm a school principal by trade. So I break down the science down to the seventh or eighth grade level. And so I, I think if we could recreate the role Clio plays in a lot of these major cities, we can move the needle. Because I'll tell you this, in 2010, when we founded Clio, the climate scientists had freaked me out completely. I founded Clio because I was nervous. And when they shared the science with me, I said, I'm very naive. I'm very young. I know you don't know that. But <laughs> the oil of Olay will kick in one of these days. But 
I thought, my, this science is real. Just give me six months, folks. I got this. I thought I would take six months, tell everybody what the facts are, and we would all want to solve the problem. Duh. I didn't understand the resistance by the oil, coal, and gas lobby and the stubbornness of some people that refused to accept the science. So 10 years later, we haven't fixed the problem yet, but man, is it a bigger tent. So in 2010, it was me and the scientists in a tent worrying about climate change. I felt I was screaming into a vacuum and not being heard. 10 years later, we have made, it's a bigger tent, it's a fuller tent, everybody's in the tent, everybody wants to be at the table from elected officials, chambers of commerce, frontline communities, communities that feel that climate gentrification is happening in their backyard, the food industry wants at the table, the bankers and the hedge funds want to understand what they can do. So that gives me hope that people care now and they're at least addressing it. Now we got to take it from conversation to action. Because you can't talk about it all day long. You gotta move the needle. And moving the needle requires economic will and political will, seriously. And that's our role. So as an individual, how can we push the political will and the economic will? I met with a hedge fund person this, at lunchtime today trying to get him on the board of directors of Clio and say, how can we get the moneyed people to really see themselves as agents of change in this fight? How can we hijack capitalism to solve the problem? How can we convince money people that you can make a lot of money doing the right thing? So we're on that trajectory now. Make sense? OK, who was next? You? So is there any way that us kids could help with stopping climate change? Hell yeah. Sorry. <laughs> First of all, I believe in the power of young people like nobody's business. I could talk all day long, and people will go, oh, she's interesting. But you open your mouth, you with that little face you have, and they will stop everything and they will listen. So part of Cleo is a movement called Gen Cleo, Generation Climate Leaders. So Cleo stands for Climate Leadership Engagement Opportunities, and that's all we do. We build climate leadership by giving people exposure to the science and to what they can do. So we have this brilliant Gen Cleo movement going on. You're welcome to come. Middle school, high school, college. We meet once a month and we plan climate strikes. And so we strike outside of the city of Miami Beach, and the kids showed up in masses, and it was theirs. They had the whole agenda, the lineup of speakers, the signs, and they were chanting, it's like, if they won't hear us, shut, uh, shut them down. We, uh, so they were like, I'm like, my paws are raising. I had this little girl in the audience say to me, hey, miss, can I speak? She's about that big. Come, Una. <laughs> She's about this big. I said, she was like biting her nails, her little t-shirt and short pants on. She goes, can I speak? This is like 600 people outside of Miami Beach City Hall. I said, what do you want to talk about, honey? She goes, my future. Uh. I said, come with me. And I took her right to the, I said to the high schoolers, put a microphone on her, let her talk. And so what can you do? Because when these kids were outside of Miami Beach, we got called for them to go up and speak to the county commission. And they asked, I mean, to the, uh, the city commission. We said, the kids said, we want you to declare a climate emergency. And a month later, they voted, and they declared a climate emergency. City of Miami, a different city, we did the same thing. We were picketing outside them. I just go there to make sure nobody kills each other. But it's really the kids, right? And Francis Suarez, who's the mayor of the city of Miami, he pulled up in his little black limo thing, you know, and he came out to talk to the kids, because he's a really personable guy, really nice guy. And the kids were saying, we need you to declare a climate emergency. This is like four months ago. And he was going, no, I will act like it's an emergency, but I will not declare an emergency. And they were like, man, that's just so wrong, man. And they're walking away, and I'm like dusting them off and putting them back in the circles. And he's hearing you. This is the first time anybody's challenged him. And that man, that Mayor Suarez, went from upsetting the kids that day to three months later declaring 
the city of Miami declaring a climate emergency. So the power of young people to influence change is like no other. And my money is on the kids and getting them in front of the school board to make sure climate education is embedded, to get them in front of the county commission and want the whole county declaring an emergency. So I think you need to understand your power as young people. You've, you've got passion, but you've got to have information. I will not send you out there to speak to people without a solid understanding of the science and the seriousness and the solutions. Because passion alone gets you nowhere. But passion, steeped in information, and unapologetically demand that you have a livable future. And your voice will carry the day. It really will. Go for it. Um, what, what made you want to start Clio? And did you think it would be just, what made you want to start Clio? And did, would you, did you think that like in a year or two, it would be perfect? Just amazing. Everyone's using electricity, air, water, sun. So I, I consider myself a change maker. If you told this little girl from Port of Spain, Trinidad, I'm an island, I'm like a Key Biscayne, Key Rat, they call you all, right? Key Rat? Yeah. So I was a barefoot in the streets of Trinidad for 12 years. I didn't wear shoes for the first 12 years of my life. You couldn't have told me then that I would be doing what I'm doing now. But when I see a problem, I want to fix it. So I started Clio because I thought that the crisis was real. I'm a science teacher. I'm a major, my science, my background is science. So I was like, I, am, I have two daughters. They're gorgeous. I don't want them growing up in a world where they won't see the biodiversity that we see. They can't look at Miami, at Biscayne Bay. I, I'm afraid that Biscayne Bay becomes smelly and nasty over time. You know what I mean? That it's not the same beautiful bay that we have. So I was motivated for change and the belief that knowledge would change behavior. I was wrong. Knowledge is key, but knowledge alone will not change behavior. You gotta have that fire in your belly, that spark. And so being an educator and being a principal and all those things, people always say to me, so what's education? And the best quote I ever saw about what education is came from William Butler Yeats. And he said, education is not the filling of a pail, it's the lighting of a fire. So I want to be an arsonist. I want to light fires in elected officials, in frontline communities, and so that they say, man, we can't put up with this, we got to fix this. Right, Edmund? Yeah. yeah. OK, who was next? So um, to answer my folk um, also, another thing kids can do, like our parents, since we have to, they, they can elect the new president, which is a big part in the decisions of our country on the, this climate problem. Uh, I don't know, mostly, most parents ask their kids what they think of which um, uh, candidate is best for this, for, for president, to become president, and um, which, pre which candidate do you think would uh, uh, help our climate problem the most? I'm a nonprofit. Don't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you could answer that. I think you asked, you said a good question. If parents are asking your advice, speak up. You should know what to tell them. And you should tell them that you want to support a climate savvy person. And that's all you say. And if they want to vote for President Trump, Again, you tell them, well, no, go speak to President Trump before you vote for him again. Go try to convince him that this is real. Because it, we really can't do this with just the Democrats or just the independents. We need everybody. So it's not about this or this. It's about getting everybody to buy into the seriousness and the solutions of what's going on. Let me get him first and then come back to you, Winston. Oh, just... oh. <laughs> Voice of doom, that's all right. According to the current science, and taking sea level rise, uh, saltwater intrusion, uh, rising temperatures, what is the predicted fate of Miami and for that matter, Key Biscayne? That's a question I get most often. We all get it at Clio. They ask us, so when do I sell? When do I leave? And the real answer is, we don't know. And it depends on how risk averse you are. 
if you own your home outright and you can walk away from it, stay, stay as long as you can. If you have all the equity tied up in your home and that is your lifeline, that's your nest egg, sell, rent, stay here. The truth is, it's probably going to be a bad hurricane that gets us out of here. Because if we got a direct hit from Irma, did you see? Irma, Irma intensified so quickly from a one to a five, and so did Michael, and all of these hurricanes that are just intensifying so fast. So our fear is that we get hit, and Miami never fully recovers. The population drops, comes back a little bit, but doesn't really fully respond. If we get lucky and we play hurricane roulette and we never get hit, there's a chance we could be here another 30, 40 years. It won't be what you think. We probably have to move people around, take people away from the low-lying areas. They call it shift the population and move them to higher ground. You know there's a ridge that runs through Miami-Dade County, a coral ridge. You know that, right? Yes, high ground. That high ground, 10 to 18 feet high. That's like the Rocky Mountains down here. <laughs> so everybody wants a piece of that land now. So maybe Miami will move where we densify the population on the high ground and we release the low-lying areas to the sea. But I'll tell you something else. When I ask the scientists, because they're all my friends, what Honestly, it's a sea level rise prediction for the next 20 years, 30 years, and then up to 2100. And I tell you, they, they irritate me. I love them, but they don't have a definite answer because some of them think it's 20 feet. <coughs> you know how much 20 feet is? It's a lot of water. But the reason they're not sure is we fully don't understand the feedback loops that are happening. We don't fully understand ice melting and a tipping point. Because it's not like I could send Winston up to Greenland or to Antarctica and talk to the ice, be the ice whisperer, and say, all right, ice, stop melting. We'll behave ourselves. Once the ice starts melting, it's going to melt. And it could topple over. And there could be a pulse of 10 feet of sea level rise in one year. That's what they're telling me. So the uncertainty of that. And you know what a feedback loop is? You students should know this. Watch me. A white surface reflects sunlight. In a warming world, that's good. We want as much of the sunlight not to come in as possible. So reflecting surfaces are good. If we keep losing the ice, the floating ice, any ice, we lose white surface. And if we lose white surface, instead of reflecting, it's absorbing heating the ocean, warming it faster, melting more ice, losing the surface. You see what I'm saying? So it's a big feedback loop. Water vapor is another feedback loop. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas. If you leave with nothing else, think about that. Think about the feedback loop. If water vapor traps that outgoing heat, right? And we have more water vapor, we're trapping more heat. And if we trap more heat, more water vapor evaporates. And if more water vapor evaporates, we trap more heat. And if we trap more heat, more water evaporates. Are you following me? Yeah. So there is this feedback loop at several levels, permafrost melting, water vapor. So my answer to you, my friend, is you, I, don't, I don't know. We sold our house, Mr. Lewis and I, we sold our house down in Pinecrest. We were on nine feet of elevation. We weren't vulnerable, but the house needed work. It was time for a new roof. It needed new plumbing. And we didn't have the resources to invest in it. <coughs> and we didn't think even if we did, we could get our money out. So we chose to sell and we're renting. But I want to stay here as long as possible and as safely as possible. Key Biscayne, you got problems. But you have time on your hand, and I hope some money and some resources. Because adaptation is dealing with the problem of what's happening. Mitigation is stopping the cause of climate change, right? Adaptation means raising roads, putting in green infrastructure, making sure that you have your dunes on the 
on the beach as high as possible, mangrove, to minimize the effect of the storm surge. So we could do a lot of that to sort of slow it down. But if you get, if we get six feet, eight feet of sea level rise, game over. Sorry, Uma. <laughs> okay, Winston and then you. Um, what, what do you think is the main question, the main answer? Like you said, knowledge is key to convincing someone. But what do you think is one of the main things that really convinces them? Since knowledge doesn't just convince them, what do you think when they say, when you say this, they really just want to go to your side? It's a great question, Winston. Very thoughtful. So I, I, he asked what, what besides knowledge? Passion, get upset. So I wanted some funding to, to work with inner cities. And the funder wouldn't give it to me. So I started spewing all the knowledge, and I had a temper tantrum at the same time. And I got the funding. So sometimes your, your passion is needed. You also have to have your facts down. But be persistent. Because they tell you no today, don't stop. And more than anything, if you can show them a way that they can make money doing the right thing, they'll do it. I am a bona fide member of the late generation. I'll be 80 in a year. Financially secure, etc. What are you doing to target me? What's your game plan for your organization to reach out to people like me and my peers and say, hey, yeah, you're not going to have to deal with a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. But what is your interest level? How do I get you excited on behalf of these young people in this room? I don't understand what your target or what your game plan is to get me into the fold. Thank you for that question. You're welcome. Because clearly he wants to play ball, and we haven't <laughs> tossed you the ball yet, have we? So the, the thing is that Clio has, we like to consider ourselves as providing multiple access points for different audiences to get climate literate. One of the access points is a speakers network. So we have a lot of people your age signing up to be climate speakers. Not because they want to do public speaking, but they want to be able to go to their grandchild's school or to talk to their family. So what we're doing is inviting you to the health symposium to come. We're inviting you to find your voice as a climate speaker, right? We are asking you, for example, to be on a panel. We're asking you to invest in food rescue. You know what food rescue is? We love food rescue. It's amazing. Imagine you have a party and you have too much food. You call food rescue. One of their little volunteers comes, picks up the food, and takes it to a homeless shelter. That's a win-win. Lots of people like you doing it. The truth is, we have three million people in Miami-Dade County, and you're all my audiences, all of us. So sorry we haven't reached you, but we need you and we want you. I'm just looking for. Would you have a suggestion for us? I'm looking for what it is that you can do to light the fire in my belly <laughs> and my many peers. I kind of think that's a brilliant question. Bernie, I'm going to toss this one to you. So Bernie Horowitz is the president of the board of the Clio Institute. He lives on Key Biscayne. And he's not quite turning 80 yet, I don't think. He just told us he was. And this young man is asking us, how do we get him at the table and get fire in his belly? Which young man is? This young man. Sorry, I was out there uh, uh, <laughs> not 100% listening to, to Caroline, but speaking with another attendee here. How do I get, you know, I think of my grandchildren, and I don't actually have to go that young, because my children are going to be affected as well. I don't understand how we as a society went from our primary concern was our children to somehow that has been shoved aside. And we said, I heard, I have friends, you know, Miami's doing very well, we're making a lot of money, this is great, you know? And I said, yeah, but think of what we're doing and what it's costing us and who's actually gonna be paying that bill. And I know who's gonna pay that bill and it is my grandkids. And they're about, well, like some one of those, of those kids. and one of those uh, in terms of age. The, uh, so 
Boy, if that doesn't motivate you, I'm not sure what will. But, but he's asking, literally asking us, why, why hasn't a group like Cleo reached him and his oh. age group? Why haven't we targeted this age group as fire in their belly kind of people? That's the question. Yeah. Well, okay, so Gen Cleo needs another Gen Cleo chapter targeting. We need a geriatric Cleo. <laughs> I object. No I object. <laughs> They're killing me. They're tough. I know, yeah. Well, I tell you, you've given me good food for thought. Mia, make sure we have his number because we're going to put him on our expert advisory council and get his input. All right. But thank you. How about if, at this point, are there any other questions or comments before we close off? Yes. Um, And you can come with the kids. So what she's talking about is a group of the Gen Cleo students who plan these climate rallies or strikes or protests or learning forums. We're trying to call them anything where they will just come down and let the kids go. The kids are cutting school to go to these things to fight for their future. This is important for them. Those who get it, they're losing sleep, they're anxious, they're nervous, they're depressed. And the school board refuses to make it an excused absence. So we've Kids have written great letters. We have one school board member really sensitive to the kids, really listening, coaching them on the side of how to do it. But the bottom line is, if you're a scholarship type of student and your grades matter, you don't want to miss school. And then the test you miss that day, you get a zero for it. So they're conscientious. So you're right. But we haven't given up. We made our first inroads, and we're going back again and again. Um, we have, we need some help with the superintendent. You know him? <laughs> All right. He's a good guy, but I think he needs to get a little bit more educated on why this is young people's fight. You, I, I have some kids who don't want to go to school at all. I have some seniors in high school who don't want to go to college. I want to stay and fight. I said, you can fight much more inside your college than you can outside by yourself. Go to college, find your group, and fight from there. So we're hoping that that will change, but it's a great point. All right, with that, we want to, first of all, wait, we got a little one here. Yes, because you haven't asked anything. Yeah. Were there like some easy, simple ways, like, we can, like things you can change in our lifestyle to contribute and better your environment? We'll stop buying so much clothes and shoes. <laughs> Watch your consumerism, right? Look at needs versus want. Do I need this? Get it. Do I want this? Can it wait for birthday? Can it wait for Christmas or Hanukkah or whatever you celebrate? Consumerism is huge. Eat less meat. I won't tell my husband to eat no meat because he would beat me up, but <laughs> eat less meat. It's not so hard. It really isn't. And if you could do those two things, if you can harass your parents to put solar on the house, buy an electric car, work on those aspects of things. There's a lot you can do, and your voice is important as well. Speak up. I, I give people a scale. On a scale of 1 to 10, how climate literate are you? How well do you know the science? 1 means I know nothing. I know some people are crazy about the science. 10 means I know everything. I'm a climate scientist. Where are you? 6. 4. 5. 8. Four. OK, I'm a 6.5, because I know how much I don't know. These scientists, it's a lot of information. But get on it. Get on the scale and move up. Keep learning. Engagement, on a scale of 1 to 10, how climate engaged are you? Do you talk about it? Do you act on it? Do you make good choices? 1, I do nothing. I'm an island. Leave me alone. 10, I don't shut up. My family hates me. I have nowhere to go for Thanksgiving. <laughs> where are you with climate engagement, 10? I'm a 12, but where are you for that? Oh, I'm like a nine. You're a 9. Good. 
Do you talk about it at home and in school? Yeah. Do your friends at school even know what's going on? No, yeah, they do. They do? They yeah. Good. Well, that's awesome. So, th so then you want, you want to ask, for example, if I were you, since you're learning about it, isn't there a parent night every year at these schools? You tell the principal, I want to be in the assembly during parent night. I want to speak to the parents and put on a little skit or a little song or a little message or a little PowerPoint. But get out there with your lovely young voices and challenge those parents. You know, here's a thing. We are going to end after this. There's an American Indian proverb that says, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. And you've got to remind people about that. Yes, sir. I'm wrong always in English. I lived in Pittsburgh, and that's the reason I came to the meeting over 50 years. I saw a transformation from the most filthy city to the most livable. It has been named twice in the last few years as the most livable city in the United States. It's quite a testimony to Pittsburgh. It's wonderful. It is winter. <laughs> I'm also from Pittsburgh, and I've been lived there my whole life, and I have some information that uh, you might be very interested in about the pollution of these companies. Because I've worked for an oil company up there for many years, and I know firsthand the pollution that they do. And they knew what they were doing. They know what they know they're doing. That. Yeah, they know. We're just going to finish the film now. There's about uh, a little under an hour left. I walked here, I hope all of you walked here, uh, and it's a great turnout.